All right, Mayala, I think we'll begin. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or at least afternoon where I am. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Bill Keck, and I'm chair of the Council on Linkages between Academia and Public Health Practice and the Academic Health Department Learning Community. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar entitled How Academic Health Department Partnerships Support Recruitment and Retention. We have what I think will prove to be an exciting lineup of speakers, and we're looking forward to engaging all of you in discussion about partnerships, in particular, partnership efforts to recruit and retain public health staff. Uh, before we begin, Mayel, if you would go over some uh, details of how things will work this, today. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, so all participants that have entered today's webinar are currently muted. We ask that you please keep yourself on mute as we go through the presentations to help reduce any background noise for your fellow participants. We will have time for questions and discussion and hope that you will jump right in when, the, when that time comes. Um, at any time during the webinar, please do use the chat box to ask any questions or share any comments you might have. When we get to our discussion, please also feel free to raise your hand. And if you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute and just jump in. If you have any technical difficulties, please send us a message in the chat box and we can help you troubleshoot. The slides for this meeting will be available through the chat box momentarily. And this meeting is being recorded and will be shared following the live event. Um, so Bill, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Mayela. <clears throat> um, the Academic Health Department Learning Community is a part of the Council on Leages between Academia and Public Health Practice. And I want to just briefly introduce that council to you. It is a consensus-driven, collaborative, comprised now of 24 national practice and academic organizations that are engaged in efforts to improve the education, training, research, and practice of public health. Um, members of the council span a variety of professional groups in public health, as well as federal agencies, the accrediting bodies for both health departments and academic public health, and the certifying body for public health professionals. And the Public Health Foundation serves as the convener, hello, hello, hello. provides staff support for the council. And the next slide, if we would then, the Academic Health Department Learning Community, as I mentioned, is an initiative of the Council on Linkages, and it aims to help support organizations working to develop and sustain academic health department partnerships providing an opportunity for people to explore the idea of these partnerships and learn from each other. The learning community has been around since 2011, is open to anyone who's interested and currently has more than 1600 members from health departments, academic institutions, and other organizations across the country. The community offers a way for people to connect with others who are engaged in this work and it also offers tools, resources, training, and technical assistance to organizations working to establish and grow AHD partnerships. Learning community activities include sharing stories and highlighting IHD partnerships, webinars such as happening today featuring academic health department partnerships, uh, we develop resources such as a collection of agreements that organizations have used to formalize partnerships, and we do our best to enable dialogue and provide assistance. And all of these resources are freely available to anyone who would like to use them. Um, to get all this started, we'd like to begin with a quick definition. Throughout today's webinar, we'll be talking about partnerships that have been built between health departments and academic institutions or as we call them, academic health department partnerships. These partnerships can take a variety of forms, but at their core, they're collaborative, mutually beneficial relationships that serve to strengthen and formalize collaboration, to move the relationship 
between the organizations beyond working together sporadically, perhaps just because two individuals happen to know and like each other, to more of a regular part of how the organizations operate. These partnerships serve to strengthen connections between public health practice and academia, enhance capacity of the organizations involved, and further the pipeline into governmental public health. Some of this helps illustrate the fact that the academic health department partnerships often develop in stages. You don't start out with a full-blown comprehensive AHD partnership right off the bat in most cases. There's a lot of work that goes into developing these partnerships and they may start quite informally with sporadic relationships gradually becoming more solid and formal, potentially involving the development of a written agreement, formalizing the partnership and how the organizations will work together to engage in education and training conduct research or deliver public health services. And even after this agreement is in place, our experience tells us that the partnership may continue to expand into additional areas and opportunities, eventually reaching a comprehensive collaboration with shared staff or other resources. But just a bit of warning, these stages are, are general. And it's entirely possible that you won't experience all of them in your organization or that you won't progress through them in a straight line. Organizations often move back and forth among the stages illustrated on the slide. And I think it's also important to emphasize that there's no one right place to be on this continuum, that you really want to build a partnership that will work for your organizations rather than being worried about how formal or not that relationship might be. It's your environment that will determine just exactly how all of this comes together. So we're excited to welcome our speakers today who are here to share about their academic health departments and how they're focusing on recruitment and retention efforts in each of their organizations. So I want to introduce very briefly all of these speakers uh, and um, then allow them to go one after the other through our presentations. And then we'll take questions at the end. But remember, you can always raise questions in the chat box as we go. So first, we'll hear from Tremanisha Stewart, Public Health Director, Health Officer of Public Health Sauk County. Tremanisha will be sharing her experiences with the Wisconsin Public Health Association Work Group on Workforce, comprised of local health department staff, college professors, and other stakeholders highlighting their retention and recruitment efforts. Next then, we'll hear from Shelby Rentmeester, Director of the Rollins Epidemiology Fellowship at the Emory University Rollins School of Public Health, will tell us about Emory's fellowship program recruitment efforts and support for early career epidemiologists in Georgia's 18 local health districts and the state health department. And then we'll hear from Courtney Desendorf, uh, Director of the Office of Practice and Learning at the Texas Department of State Health Services, and Robert Hammerberg, Assistant Director of Public Health Practice and Engagement at the University of Texas Health Houston School of Public Health. And they'll close out with a presentation about their partnership between the Texas Department of State Health Services and the UT Health Houston School of Public Health and how their partnership has aided with early career recruitment efforts. So Tremanisha, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Tremanisha Stewart, and I am the health officer for a county called Sauk in Wisconsin. And I'm here today to share about the work we're doing in Wisconsin as a part of a statewide work group. Next slide, please. So as far as our partners, as previously alluded to, our partners were the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, University of Wisconsin is our land grant university in this state. Another partner was the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards. This is also how the health officers and other local health department staff were 
uh, recruited to do this work or invited to do this work. Uh, they, in addition to, with uh, the Wisconsin Public Health Association, work together to bring issues of importance in public health to uh, arise and to a hopeful resolution. The next partner is our Wisconsin Department of Health Services Division of Public Health, and that is our state health department. Next slide, please. And so as we began to meet as a work group, we didn't want to have meetings that were haphazard or didn't have a focus. So we decided to lend our focus to state and national models. Some of those models being the public health services framework, the 3.0 model, and in Wisconsin, local public health is regulated by a statute called one, DHS 140. Locally, we just call it the 140. And that was important because it's one is how we regulate it here in Wisconsin, but also it is um, grounded in things from fab, like having our job descriptions to the greatest extent possible be competency-based. Now, some jurisdictions can't do that, and we are very home rule here in Wisconsin, but using some of those tenants in that statute helped frame some of our conversations. Next slide, please. Another thing or community that we utilized in our work was the 21st century learning community, which is comprised of 18 states across the country. And we were able to lean on this community for other things people were doing around the nation that we wanted to utilize in our own state and use those conversations to springboard some of our ideas. I jokingly say that in our formal education, we are, you know, taught and ingrained that we should not be plagiarizing and that's wrong, but we find ourselves doing it all the time in our professional worlds in sharing and, you know, relying on each other so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so that was utilized in this context. Next slide, please. And so it wasn't just workforce that was a work group that uh, did work work world uh, statewide for us uh, from the Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards. They received ARPA funding, which allowed us to do three different work groups with health officers and local health personnel uh, involved in all of it. And so one of those work groups were funding, and so. Wisconsin is one of the lowest invested public health states in the country. And with the COVID pandemic, we received an onslaught of unprecedented money, but how do we maintain a sustainable funding sources for our infrastructure here in Wisconsin? And so that work group put together um, ideas, the same as we did in workforce. For workforce, since the beginning, a little bit before the pandemic, we have lost over half or just about half of our health officers, and even more when you consider the staff that staff these health departments. And so how do we support a capable, diverse, and inclusive workforce? And that was the main aim of our work group. And then lastly, the legal authority. Um, you're lucky if you did not have to face legislators wanting to limit your control on communicable disease, but Wisconsin was one of those where our authority was constantly up for debate. And so another work group was put together to clarify our ability and strengthen our control in communicable disease. Next slide, I will be furthermore talking about workforce for the remaining of my time here with you. So the workforce work group, as I said, was comprised of all types of local health partners, invested in workforce retention and recruitment. We've been meeting monthly since March of 2022, and we focus on an array of workforce development initiatives. One productive initiative of ours was that we were able to reinvigorate academic health departments or academic institutions and really um, reinvigorate those relationships. Some of them were dare I say, stale from over the years. And this work group worked to invigorate some of those that needed a little bit of sprucing up. Next slide, please. Another um, 
thing that came out of this work group was that it was for use for everyone. So it didn't really matter if you were an academic health department or not, that what we were able to produce would be of benefit to everyone. One of those things being a website. And so this slide depicts all the things that went into our website that is public facing. There are some things that still need to be included. So it's a little bit still under construction, but one of the first things this group decided to take on was job descriptions. As I mentioned, our statute states to the greatest degree possible that we are to have competency-based job descriptions. And so while we waited through that, we also found that Region 5 Public Health Training Center already had those job descriptions as a template, something you can download and just make your own already on their website. So we just linked that to ours and that's what we did, we shared. And we were able to have uh, model job descriptions in case we ever needed it. Uh, we also included onboarding checklists, examples of policies and procedures, succession planning uh, for retention, the same succession planning, professional development opportunities, examples of resource service and sharing and resource libraries. So typical things we thought of that might be a time suck for a health officer, whether they were new or tenured. Uh, we wanted to create a place where they can have a one-stop shop to find documents that might be useful to them. Next slide, please. Another product of our work together were workforce summits. And so our first one was August of last year. So local health department staff, health departments, um, I'm sorry, health officers and uh, academic partners all met in person and we completed a SOAR analysis. We identified opportunities for building a workforce in Wisconsin and we had a very engaging discussion about what we aspired to see happen in our workforce. We liked that so much that we did it again in May and we, from that point, planned for partnerships between academic partners and local health departments. We also identified goals for ongoing collaboration. Next slide, please. And even, I'll get to the goals in the next slide that were developed, but just wanted to point out that we are, in Wisconsin, have a very strong history of our academic partners working together. There always is a willingness to share information. It's not a competitive space and just a very strong history of pulling it together and working together. Next slide, please. And so the goals that were developed from the summits were to enhance the public workforce. Uh, as I mentioned, we have taken a great loss over the past couple of years to sustain the relationships between local health departments and academic partners to stabilize our workforce, to coordinate a system of formal courses for current public health personnel here in Wisconsin. Um, I believe it's 12% of our um, staff or health officers do not have a public health degree. So how do we orientate those that without that public health background into public health? Um, coordinating a system for public, I'm sorry, professional development and approaching mentoring and precepting in a systemic way. Next slide, please. And so we did a lot of work in a little over a year. And so our next steps will be to replicate this with our nursing programs in Wisconsin, explore opportunities for professional development through the new to public health program, convene those summits that I talked about twice a year. And that takes, all of this takes money. So seeking additional funding for the future is our next steps. The next slide is my last slide. And um, thank you so much for your time and attention. I will say that this would not be possible without Barb Durst. She was not only the facilitator and leader of our workforce work group, but she also put these slides together and has been intimately involved with this work and could best answer any questions you have, but I'm happy to take a stab. Great. Thank you so much, Trimanisha. Appreciate that. Um, now let's move on to our next presentation from Shelby Rentmeester. Shelby, it's it's all yours. 
Thank you um, for having me today to present on our program. I'm going to talk about the Rollins Epidemiology Fellowship Program, which is based at Emory University in the Rollins School of Public Health, previously the Rollins COVID-19 Epidemiology Fellowship. So uh, next slide. Um, so this program is an initiative that was started in 2020 to address the increased need for epidemiologists to work on the COVID-19 response in Georgia. The mission of the program is to enhance Georgia's state and local public health programs by training exceptional epidemiologists who passionately serve their communities through surveillance, outbreak response, and general public health practice um, with an overall vision that we aim to support new epidemiologists and increase our epidemiology capacity in Georgia to serve our communities. Next slide. So before I get into the specifics of the program, I'm gonna briefly touch on that academic public health partnership model, um, and then the context of the program and where our team feels like we are on that spectrum. So I would not be here today if it wasn't for Dr. Allison Chamberlain. She's the faculty director and principal investigator for the program. She previously and currently has been working part-time as faculty in the Department of Epidemiology and then part-time as a consultant for the Fulton County Board of Health, which is the major Metro Atlanta County Board of Health since 2017. So we see this as stage one, not to say that it wasn't a formal relationship, but rather the foundation for the broader movement towards academic public health partnerships at Rollins. Next slide. Her work led to the establishment of the Emory COVID-19 Response Collaborative in June of 2020, which was a structure for Rollins faculty, students, and staff to aid and support Georgia state and local public health partners for COVID-19 response. Next slide. And then all of that work and our administration and operations team led to the um, formal MOA between Emory and the Department of Public Health um, in July of 2020. And then this is renewed yearly, which is what we're um, kind of structured under. Next slide. So now we are in the expansion phase, which includes a few different initiatives, including the fellowship program that I'm discussing today. Next slide. So to accomplish the goals of our fellowship program, we hire recent Master of Public Health graduates interested in applied epidemiology as full-time Emory employees for two-year placements within one of the 18 health districts across Georgia or at the State Department of Public Health office. The program consists of a competency-based curriculum coupled with entry-level epidemiologist roles. So we like to say it's about 90% um, doing the day-to-day -day work of an entry-level epi-1, and then about 10% of fellowship trainings, programming, mentorship. Next slide. As I mentioned, our program was established in the fall of 2020 but we modeled after some already well-known public health fellowship programs, such as CDC's EIS program, CSTE's Applied Epidemiology Fellowship, and the Florida and California's EIS programs. However, there are some distinct differences for our specific program. As compared to EIS, our program focuses on master's level epidemiologists rather than doctoral, as compared to CSTE, which typically focuses on state departments of public health across the country, our program is narrowly focused on Georgia at the state and local levels. And then compared to Florida and California's programs, which are operated through the governmental side of public health, our program is operated through the academic side. Next slide. When it comes to the administration of the program, I'm not going to go into all of the specifics for the sake of time, but we do categorize them into these three buckets, uh, fellow recruitment and management, site engagement and satisfaction, and learning goals and objectives 
aka the fellows professional development um, through the program. And so we have systems in place that we're continuously monitoring and evaluating, getting feedback from the fellows and their supervisors in order to improve our processes with each new cohort and or new training that we're offering or any piece of our program. Um, we wanna be sure that our program is being responsive to the health district's needs and priorities and also developing the next generation of applied epidemiologists and public health leaders in Georgia. Next slide. As I mentioned, in comparison to some of the other epidemiology fellowship programs, there are a few unique aspects. However, one that really stands out is our academic mentorship component. In addition to the applied epidemiologist roles and competency-based trainings, we have a group-based mentorship model where fellows meet quarterly with an academic mentor. Next slide. Um, and here are the mentors that are actively engaged or have previously acted as mentors for our program. Each of these Rollins faculty or staff members has experience in state or local public health practice, and their role is to act as a third party for the fellows who have professional development questions or need additional guidance as they transition to their public health careers, someone outside of their site supervisor and me as their MRE supervisor that they can talk through with some of their questions. Next slide. Back, back, back up, I think one more. Yeah, okay. Um, and here's the pride of our program. Um, it's small because there's a lot of them at this point, but this is the map of fellows who've been part of our program since we started in 2020. Over the course of four cohorts, we've recruited and hired 50 fellows. And then the bold names are those that have graduated. And as I mentioned, they have placements throughout Georgia, North, South, Metro, Atlanta, all over the place. Um, next slide. On the slide are some examples of the routine activities that our fellows have worked on throughout the course of their fellowships. COVID-19 and notifiable disease investigations, surveillance system management, cleaning and analysis, report building, um, community engagement opportunities, like radio and news interviews and attending or leading community coalition meetings. And then some of our um, fellows have attended and presented at conferences, both regionally and nationally. Next slide. In the summer of 2022, so last summer, we contracted with an external evaluator to receive some confidential input on our program and how we can improve and remain relevant in responses to the needs of our public health partners and fellows. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of the details of that evaluation, but I wanna share an overview from the district supervisors on the overarching value of our program. Nearly all of the district supervisors um, relayed that they had a positive experience with the fellowship program and several shared that their fellows played a vital role in helping them address the pandemic and other emerging issues. Many were pleased with the caliber of the fellows and their contributions and overwhelmingly supervisors agreed the program should continue and adapt at that point. Um, as I mentioned, the program started as the Rollins COVID-19 Epidemiology Fellowship and everyone agreed last summer that we should expand beyond COVID. Um, and so we did, and over half felt that the program could stay focused on epidemiology, while some suggested we could expand into include other areas as well. Next slide. Um, and because today's focus of the session is on recruitment and retention, we do monitor the job placements for graduated fellows after they leave our program. This is a little not formatted exactly correctly, so I apologize and can fix it for those that need it, but um, of the 25 graduated fellows in the first two cohorts, over half stayed in local state and local public health positions. A striking statistic for us is that the current and alumni fellows make up almost a third of master's level EPIs in Georgia's local health districts. 
Next slide. So over the past three years, we've taken all of the feedback and lessons learned to heart. Um, we've transitioned beyond COVID-19 and are excited to continue into the future. We just hired our fourth cohort as of August, and we are confirmed for a uh, cohort five that we are preparing for the recruitment to start this coming spring. Um, we absolutely succeed because of the relationships that we have with the Department of Public Health and um, doing routine evaluations of our processes. So that way we can continuously adapt to the ever-changing landscape of public health in Georgia and the priorities of our state and local health partners. Next slide. Thank you. This is my email. Please feel free to, to reach out at any point. Otherwise, I will be happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Excellent, Shelby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work and presenting it to us today. And that takes us then to our next presenters, uh, Courtney Desendorf and Robert Hammersberg. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney, and I am the director for the Office of Practice and Learning at the Texas Department of State Health Services. Um, and today, um, I'm going to share how our strong academic relationships have helped us with recruitment and retention. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Robert Hammerberg from the UT Health Houston School of Public Health, which was the first school where we formalized as an academic health department, which we refer to as our academic public health partnership. So I'll let Robert introduce himself now. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Robert Hammerberg. Uh, I currently serve as Assistant Director of Public Health Practice and Engagement and a faculty associate within our Department of Management Policy and Community Health at UT Health Houston School of Public Health. Uh, my office, to give you some perspective, oversees practicum services, career services, alumni engagement, and engagement with our academic and non-academic collaborators, uh, which includes oversight of our academic health department-like relationships, and I'm thrilled to be with you all this afternoon. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so before I get into the specifics of our recruitment and retention activities, I thought it'd be helpful to give you a little bit of background on the structure of the public health system in Texas, um, which impacts how we have approached and structured our academic partnerships. So Texas is a big state. We have um, over 250 counties sectioned off into eight public health regions, and our main um, central office is located in Austin, Texas. Um, local and county health departments operate independently, um, and where there's not a local health department, the state health department offers public health services in those areas. Um, so again, Texas is a big state, and we have a lot of universities, um, and our agency recognized the importance of our academic colleagues as one um, of our strategic plan items is to build an organized network of academic partners across the state. Um, so next slide. Um, and I would also like to give a little overview of our office, the Office of Practice and Learning. Um, I think it's a unique part of our agency. Um, our work is highly collaborative um, across our agency and across Texas, and we kind of operate like a little mini university inside of a health department. So we focus on workforce development, education and experiential learning, um, advancing research and academic engagement initiatives. And, um, you know, much of our work centers around people building and training the current and future workforce. Um, I've included a, just a list of um, some of the programs that our office administers. Um, and now um, I'll hand it over to Robert to share a little about the UT Health Houston School of Public Health. So next slide. Thanks, Courtney. So since our beginning, we've made strides towards achieving a reality where health has no boundaries. And so we uh, have exercised that through having faculty through four diverse uh, departments, as well as six physical locations across the state of Texas. Uh, and Texas's unique racial and geographic and economic diversity allows uh, us to explore a wide range of public health areas, which is one of the reasons why uh, us partnering in this way just made the most sense um, because of both organizations statewide reach. So, but also a little bit about our school. So we are the oldest school of public health uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, we have a large student population. We are an all graduate school of public health. 
Um, and we uh, not only have a statewide impact with our physical locations and presences, but we have uh, 17 research centers uh, that are on various topics such as big data, community impact, health equity, infectious disease, pediatric population health, et cetera. Um, all of those things are resources that we believe are avenues for collaboration uh, and connection with our uh, academic public health partners. So just wanted to provide that detail as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so because of our close um, academic partnerships, our office is well suited to provide general outreach and, uh, and increase uh, to increase awareness and interest for public health careers and to provide um, early career public health recruitment. Um, so we use our outreach we use our um, outreach activities with academic partners in our programs to help our agency build its brand that it, it is one that invests in um, early career public health professionals. So um, we hope to show that um, our agency sees value in mentoring and developing staff, um, as well as helping provide some clear um, career trajectories, um, which can also help with um, retention as well. Um, and in terms of recruitment this past year, we attended um, almost 40 different camp campus events. These events include various career and intern fairs, career panels, um, some of our staff serving as class speakers and guest lecturers. Um, and we did this across um, like oh, almost 30 different universities um, across Texas. So, and we also host, um, we try to do a lot of um, large scale virtual events. Um, so we hosted one that had over 700 attendees and these include public health and non-public health students too. Um, we have um, built upon this and um, have monthly virtual career panels um, already scheduled for this fall and actually this spring as well. Um, and we invite all the schools of public health we partner with and also extend again to um, other public non public health university staff and students. Um, we um, have our we have a fellowship that was similar to the one that was described earlier. Um, um, we're currently in our second cohort of the Texas Public Health Fellowship Program, which is a one year full time paid training program um, designed for um, recent graduates or P or individuals you know early in their public health career. So um, fellows come from a wide um, um, variety of backgrounds, levels of education, and have varied public health interests. And they're either placed within DSHS or at a local health department. And we also um, provide um, career coaching, a mentor, and many um, opportunities for professional development that we um, also pay for too. Um, the program um, currently runs from June 1st to May 31st, and we have about 40 um, in this year's cohort. Um, we also have an internship program. We host about 100 interns per year, um, and we've seen, um, with our increased university engagement, we've seen about a 10% 10 per, 10 increase in our number of interns from 2022 to 2023. Um, you know, for retention, we've utilized our academic partners to speak at our monthly Grand Round series, um, as well as um, um, provided them, um, we've provided um, information to our academic partners about different trainings that would be helpful for us. So they've actually given some like customized training to staff. Um, so the fellowship, internship, um, we also have a preventive medicine residency program. Um, they've all been impactful programs and mechanisms to build this pipeline of public health professionals. So in terms of uh, retention, um, last year's fellows fellowship graduates, um, we have uh, about 40% of them um, received a, a, a full-time job, um, either working at DSHS, a local health department, or some type of governmental public health position. And then about 40% um, about also um, are now um, continuing in their education, either in a graduate program, um, a medical, um, getting um, an MD or a nursing program. Um, and also with our internships, um, in the past two years, about 25% of our interns are hired on into full-time positions. Um, and with our residency program, um, currently two of our regional medical directors and our TB elimination ph physician are all graduates of the residency program. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Robert. He's gonna talk more about the role that they play in recruitment and retention. 
Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Um, so I want to talk about what we're currently doing and then also briefly about what we have planned. So, but before I wanted to take a moment to share my definition of recruitment and retention as I see it uh, and uh, through the eyes of a university helping a public health agency with recruitment and retention, right? So through our partnership, I see recruitment as a means of uh, not only developing the future public health workforce through education, but by connecting students with experiential learning and also just general face time opportunities with the organization. Um, I also see our school contributing to DSHS's staff retention by participating in community building. Uh, and I approach re retention through the lens of community, uh, meaning not just an exchange of information over the internet, uh, but community is more about a feeling and relationships and built among people to have a little group um, with shared goals, experiences, and interests. And if we're able to contribute to that through our academic partnership, then that is great. And so with that in mind, we do contribute to the recruitment of the DSHS workforce through intentional promotion and placement of students and experiential learning opportunities, uh, building students' career readiness by hosting DSHS-specific panels, information sessions, and they also host uh, application seminars to our students. Uh, we also actively promote available positions within the agency through our weekly career services newsletter uh, and posts on our career uh, placement dashboard. We utilize Handshake uh, for that. We also intentionally included DSHS in the Gaining Equity and Training for Public Health Informatics and Technology, which is the acronym is Get Fit Initiative. Uh, that initiative was funded by nearly $10 million uh, awarded by the HHS Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. And through that program, we're able to match and place students in internship positions funded by the grant uh, at various organizations needing health informatics support, uh, which includes our partnership with DSHS. Uh, so we also contribute to the retention of the workforce by building community connections through co-facilitation of Grand Rounds events, like Courtney mentioned, uh, featuring a mix of DSHS staff and our faculty as well, so that we can get some bi-directional learning going there. Uh, DSHS has also shared with us an interest among staff for professional development trainings on various topics, like Courtney mentioned, and we've supported this by connecting that desire with faculty here at the school who could provide that training, and an example is uh, one of our faculty will be leading a class on our training for DSHS staff. Um, through the Get Fit initiative, one of the goals is developing opportunities for career placement after students graduate, and that's been successful in our collaboration with DSHS, as we have had students actually offered and have taken positions with DSHS after completing the Get Fit internship program. So through Get Fit, we've also worked with our consortium partners to develop a health informatics professional development training. And we've made that available fully online at no cost to our partners, including DSHS. So we're contributing to the workforce development uh, of DSHS in that way uh, so that they can get the latest and greatest in health informatics and translating that into their current position within the agency. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention that through the Get Fit grant, we earmarked funds to be provided to our collaborative partners who are mostly comprised of state and local health agencies to use as they see fit to support and develop their workforce. So there's just a, a few different ways that we're actively collaborating. Next slide. And then, uh, you know, I previously shared the efforts that we're currently pursuing, but moving forward, I see us working more closely to intentionally identify and place students in internship opportunities across the state. You know, we are, again are an institution with a statewide reach and community ties, just like DSHS is. And we've been working with them to spread awareness of what that means to host interns uh, and where those opportunities of benefit lie for both DSHS and the student across the state. So I see us working more closely together to build those avenues and ultimately an internship career placement pipeline. Uh, speaking of, we started a series of lunch and learns where we're hosting opportunities to build regional connections between DSHS regional offices and our locations throughout the state. And those have served as great opportunities for students and faculty to learn about the DSHS uh, organization and its statewide and regional goals. Uh, and for us to share what opportunities we have for student and faculty involvement uh, in those efforts. So that's something we're continuing uh, throughout the upcoming years. And then uh, in addition to hosting students for experiential learning opportunities, uh, we've discussed exploring topics like creating an adjunct professor-like position within DSHS. Uh, though uh, through our partnership, we've developed avenues for easy creation of adjunct professorships at our university. Uh, but we want to see what that would look like uh, on the converse. Um, and with regard to retention, 
and supporting that community feeling within DSHS, we plan to develop stronger ties with between the staff at DSHS and our classrooms to share their expertise and grant regular opportunities for them to contribute to the learning environment and get face time with students. Uh, we'd also like to involve them more in the development of future and revamped coursework uh, and feel that connection to our school and students uh, and team in that way. Next slide. Thanks, Robert. Um, I, I wanted to share a few resources that we've created to help with recruitment. So um, the first is a career fair um, toolkit. So I think a couple of our staff are on, on the call. So this is all of their hard work. Um, uh, so um, this is just a career fair toolkit for our staff to use when attending a career internship fair. Like we said, we're spread out across the state and you know, not everyone has the time to develop these things. So um, this was created um, based on feedback from our university partners, specifically students on what type of information would be helpful to them um, um, when attending these um, types of fairs. So again, we're a small team. Um, this is to help encourage our, our regional staff and other staff to participate in these activities. Um, creating these documents also, you know, creates consistency in the message that we're sharing with students. So again, this is a recruitment tool, but I think it also can be a retention tool because I know a lot of people that work in public health, they want to feel that connection to students. And, and I think that they value that, that type of mentorship experience. Um, next slide. Um, and here are some examples of some recruitment flyers we've created um, for early career entry level positions. So the purpose of these are to drive more applicants to our job portal to help them better navigate the job postings and provide some concrete examples of what entry level jobs look like. Um, this is an example of a public health lab job. Uh, next slide. And then here are some um, recruitment flyers on what careers can um, students pursue in public health related to their majors. So they might not be a public health major, but maybe they're a chemistry or kinesiology. Um, so, um, so far our team has created about 20 of these info sheets related to different majors. Um, so relating different majors to practical skills and jobs within the public health field. So um, from communications, anthropology, psychology, history. Um, so we sh um, we post these flyers on our, our website and then um, um, have them for university and community outreach events. So next slide. Um, thank you all again. Um, feel free to contact um, us if you have any questions and we really appreciate um, your time and letting us share with you today. Thank you so much, Courtney and Robert. Um, now, Maella, I know that you and Ron have been tracking questions in the chat box and uh, I see that many of them have been answered, but perhaps you could get us into the question and discussion period. Certainly, Great, so Mayella, oh, Mayella, would you like me to chime in with what's in the chat box? Yes, go ahead. I'm just going to stop sharing so we can all see each other. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, there are a lot of questions there. And one thing I'll say is with uh, 11 minutes remaining, we may not get to all of them. And what we'll do is we'll look at questions that have not been answered and we will send them out to our colleagues here who've been presenting and see if we can get some answers and send them out uh, along with either with the archive link or afterwards. Okay, so we have a question here for Shelby. Do you have any feedback from graduated fellows that stayed in local or state public health on what led them to stay and if they plan to stay even longer? Yeah, so um, the feedback from those who have stayed are kind of like th three things. One is the continued ability to, to fund their positions in the districts. Um, that is a very big logistical barrier that happens. And when that happens, sometimes our fellows need to end our program a little bit early. And we've created actually an adjacent fellow position where they transition to a DPH position and we continue to support them with access to the trainings and professional development opportunities. Um, other are supportive environments. They love working with the teams that they're in. That is a huge 
factor of who the team is that already exists in the district and opportunities for continued professional development within the district or higher roles. So for example, some fellows have stayed on as um, more senior epidemiologist roles. Others have gone into leadership roles. So STD um, program manager, public health analysts, immunization coordinators, something adjacent to epidemiologists, but the ability to take on a, a more senior or leadership role is very valued by the fellows. Um, in terms of whether they are expressing they want to continue, our first fellow group of fellows, our first cohort, graduated last fall. So they've been out of our fellowship for like one year only, and we are going to continue following up with them um, in alumni surveys to find out more about their where they are, how they're transitioning, if they are staying in their positions. Um, I might be adding a question about their intention to stay. And uh, that's a really great point. So thanks. We have a variety of questions related to funding. Surprise, right? And I did respond to one that indeed the public health infrastructure grant funds can be used for pretty much everything we're talking about here today. Um, so clearly, if you have uh, people in the state health department, in a territorial health department, larger city health department receiving funds, they can be used for this purpose. But to our panelists, what else? I know some of you mentioned foundations, maybe there's something else in the state budget or whatever, but what other funding sources, Any anything you'd like to share? Um, nope. Currently, no, that's how. Um, that's we're we're funded through several CDC grants right now, and we're trying to secure continued funding to to keep our fellowship um, running. So, um, we are open to ideas as well. <laughs> Courtney, I I would just to follow up on that. I wouldn't um, if there is an opportunity to work with your development office at either either in the if if the, the partner academic partners development office has connections to foundations in Texas. See if you can get in front of them um, and talk to, to them about the fellowship and internship programs that you guys have started, because it really can resonate with a lot of foundations, especially those that are state that are interested in health of a specific state. Um, and, and, and you might get some traction there. Um, Ron, just to go back to my question the earlier um, about funding from CDC infrastructure grants, States who have those CDC workforce infrastructure grants can bid out or make subcontracts to academic institutions to start fellowships like this. They they can do they can actually do subcontracts with any appropriate institution that is providing a service that's related to the intent of the grant. Right. And the intent of the grant is building foundational public health services with a strong emphasis on workforce. Um, so I would see no reason why they could not. Of course, one of the problems you encounter is it could take 12 months, 18 months, or longer for the health department to go through its procurement process. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. There is a question, Robert, and I suspect that others also might um, uh, want to chime in, other panelists. Do public health staff teach in your institution? Yeah, yes, they do. Um, it's something that actually we are working towards in the future, making uh, that more known, that that's an option uh, for DSHS staff members. We have had several, obviously we have several alums that work uh, within the organization who uh, also serve as adjunct professors with us uh, and so forth. And so that is something that uh, we are looking to expand just the general awareness that that is an avenue for them so that we can get them in the classroom and get that exposure uh, and translate that real world practice of what they're doing to, through their daily life to what they're learning in the classroom. So yes, they, they can. Great, I'll, I'll add a question to it, to this, based on what's been asked over the Academic Health Department Learning Community Listserv. Do staff and health departments who teach uh, do they have library privileges within the university? Robert, I see you nodding your head. Yes. 
So I will say it, it might be easier at some institutions than at others. Uh, ours, if you have an adjunct professor appointment, uh, you have access to all of those resources. If not, what we have done too with some of our other academic health department colleagues is uh, grant uh, guest accounts to, to those that we know are gonna be utilizing those resources. Um, but uh, those are the two avenues that we have. And Mayela, do we have time for another question? Okay, great. And this yeah, is all well, for Courtney and Robert. Uh, the higher rate for interns is interesting. Any idea what contributed to that outcome or drivers to continue to grow that number? Are you referring to the 25%? I think that's what. Um, uh, I mean, honestly, I feel like we have um, put a lot of uh, resources. So we have Craig on the line here. Um, he is our education programs manager and he um, and our staff have done a really good job of outreach. Um, we've also just tried to do a better job of actually tracking the numbers. So um, just, I know y'all all know probably navigating <laughs> the system um, can be challenging in terms of um, collecting alumni information. But, um, you know, I think some of our staff have even done like some searches on LinkedIn, like really trying to track down um, to, to get a, a right number because, um, you know, the data does matter in terms of funding. And if we can show that this investment is is allowing us to build this pipeline and create jobs and keep people on and keep people wanting to stay and work for us um you know that's meaningful so we've done um we've made more efforts to to dig and find uh, the numbers but i think it's just we're trying to um you know engage students more and 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 open our outreach um not again not just we love our schools of public health i'm not saying that but outreach to other um, schools and universities as well so Mayela, I'm going to say two quick things here. Uh, one is there's a question about uh, any online curriculum. And if people have that, if you could put any links in the uh, chat box, that would be great. <clears throat> the other is uh, Tremonesia, you should go to your sort of neighbor, it's a little bit, not quite a neighbor, Indiana, where they had a 1500% increase in funding for public health uh, this past year based on a governor's public health commission. And we wish you the same increase in Wisconsin. Mayela or Bill, back to one of you. Thanks, Ron. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you everyone for joining and for your questions. I'm just gonna close out here with some of our AHD partnership resources. Um, I think many of you are already a part of our academic health department learning community. If you are not, please feel free to send me an email and I can go ahead and add you to that. And you can also find more information about that at phf.org slash AHDLC. Um, and it's just a peer community that supports um, public health practice and academic collaboration. Um, we also will have many more of these webinars um, that you can also find archives for on the website. Um, along with resources and tools that will help to support your development, maintenance, and expansion of your AHD partnerships. Um, and of course, if you would like to stay connected, please sign up for our newsletter, uh, the Council on Linkages Updates, which features the latest AHD partnership resources. Um, and the last minute that we have here, um, I want to take the moment to invite you all to join us again tomorrow for our SWATI webinar. Um, you can either click this link in the PA, uh, PDF folder or in the PDF file, sorry, or you can use this QR code. Um, so that will be tomorrow from two to three. Um, and that will focus on using a SWATI analysis. So including inclusion and equity in your SWOT analysis. Um, and the last thing, is to um, invite you all to join us at our Public Health Learning Forum and Train Learning Network annual meeting. This will take place in person October 16th to 19th in Richmond, Virginia. And this year's theme is rebuilding the public health workforce. So we would love it if you could join us to um, talk about workforce development and training. Ron and Bill, any last words before we go? <laughs> No, I think not. Just our thanks to all of our presenters and all of our participants for joining us. Uh, you make us what we are, and we're delighted to have 
you with us this afternoon. Great. Thank you all so much. And thank you again to our presenters. So goodbye, everyone.